hello and welcome everyone. The uh, topic for tonight is the perfection of Viria. And um, about a month ago, I did a second part of a presentation on the perfection of Kashanti, which is the perfection of patience. And I thought it might be interesting to go ahead and just move on from the third to the fourth perfection, hence the beginning of this presentation. So to start out, um, I'm doing the same thing that I did with my earlier presentation, which is following um, Nagarjuna's commentary on the Great Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. And my purpose behind that is uh, I wanted to look at sort of an authoritative classical text for the Chinese Tiantai school. So it's like probably the least controversial version of what we're getting, but also fairly detailed. And I think there are interesting details that maybe we wouldn't look at necessarily from a contemporary perspective that might actually be interesting to investigate. So I'm following that same, that same uh, method in, in this presentation. So to start out, um, the term Viria itself has been translated many different ways. You'll see sometimes vigor, diligence, energy, endeavor, etc. cetera. Um, Vichu Dharma Mitra's translation of Nagarjuna's commentary uses the uses the term vigor. <clears throat> I chose throughout my presentation to instead just use the term virya. And I think that one of the reasons I really wanted to do this is <clears throat> that virya is a word that has Indo Indo-European roots to the same word that we get our word virility from which was sort of one of the original contexts of this term in Sanskrit. And it was applied to people who were warriors. So a warrior could have virya. And then later it was became part of the Buddhist path, the notion that there was sort of a, a spiritual religious form of the same kind of energy and, and diligence and sort of all of those things clustered together. The other is that the Buddha himself is often referred to as a vira, a great hero. So I kind of wanted to keep the term just for the resonance. <clears throat> So I think the question that maybe comes first is, why would something like vigor, diligence, uh, endeavor, all of these things, why would that be the fourth of the six perfections? And when we're looking at the six perfections, um, <clears throat> here's just a set of them. Uh, you can see different translations. But the first three of, of generosity, charity, ethics, patience, <clears throat> there's kind of a division after these, where then we get into virya, which is the fourth, meditation, and then wisdom. And one of the ideas is that if you approach these sequentially, the first three are fairly easy to do, and the last three become much more difficult. So one of the things that you have to consider is that, as Nagarjuna puts it, so you're generous, big deal. Even animals do generous things for other animals. We can see these kinds of things all over the place. And there's nothing you know, necessarily difficult about being generous or being ethical or being patient. Now, it does become difficult when you're trying to perfect those qualities, when you're trying to go very deep with them. And so in that sense, there's kind of this dividing line where when you're about to approach meditative practice and wisdom, you start having to put a lot more effort into it because those are things that don't really come naturally to us. And I really like this analogy of um, the Buddhist path being like a, a lamp that you're trying to use to light something. And if you just have it out in the open, the flame gets blown around and you can barely see anything around it. You have to sort of have it in a space where there's something to block that wind. And then it can illuminate an entire room and you can actually see very far with it. And this is sort of one way that we can think about the purpose of Viria when we're approaching meditation and wisdom, but also the previous three perfections because it applies to all of them. And the point's made that all of the benefits of the Buddhist path actually arise from Viria. Everything that we do on the Buddhist path takes some level of effort, but virya and the perfection of virya are two different things. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so basically, no matter how many good deeds that you perform, there's going to be a point where eventually you're going to have to really put dedicated effort and energy into what you're doing to be able to move beyond that point. <clears throat> <clears throat> so for arhats, who are the people who seek individual enlightenment, there's obviously a lot of effort that goes into it. They basically have to follow a lot of ascetic practices, be able to cut off their various attachments and reach some stage of awakening. 
But this is likewise true for the Bodhisattva path, which is why this is also one of the perfections. And from the Bodhisattva perspective, it becomes really obvious why you need Virya, right? If you think about the four Bodhisattva vows that we say at the end of the service. I mean, even the first one, sentient beings are numberless, I vow to save them. I mean, that's going to take some effort, right? Like, that's a pretty huge ask. So from the Bodhisattva perspective, you really need to be able to learn how to perfect Virya because it's something that you need lifetime after lifetime after lifetime to be able to even keep going, to be able to accomplish the task that you're trying to accomplish. So I guess we could get a little deeper into what exactly is Virya. And I like this list that, that Nagarjuna gives. He says, Virya is the root of all good dharmas, meaning that any good thing that we do requires effort going into it. It's the activator of karmic blessings from the past. In other words, we're in the middle of a situation and there are all kinds of potentials, but those potentials don't mean anything if we don't take some sort of action in that context. Virya doesn't fear the hells, and we'll get a little more into this later. Sounds good. Like <laughs> doesn't it, though? Bring it on. <laughs> Virya is additionally important in completing endeavors. This is kind of intuitive. You know, you need to be able to complete something, so you have to put effort into it to accomplish it. And then also that it's present in all of the path <clears throat> practice categories. And there's actually a long list of, you know, the 10 these, the 27 that, et cetera, et cetera. And you'll find Virya in most of them. It's something that's pretty universally important among Buddhist teachings that various schools follow. So moving on to the characteristics of Virya, there's a list of the five characteristic features. And we're not going to spend a lot of time on these. They're pretty self-explanatory. But the first one is that with regard to endeavors, one has the attitude that he is certainly able to succeed. In taking them up, one finds no difficulty. One's determination and intentions are solid and strong. One's mind is free of weariness. And whatever is engaged in is carried through to the end. And these are sort of the, these five characteristic features kind of give us an idea of, of what it looks like when, when you possess this virya, when you cultivated it, right? And then additionally, uh, there's, a, there's a quote attributed to the, to the Buddha in the text that says that virya is characterized by the mind and body not resting. I love definitions like this because it's very straightforward. So not resting, that's virya, boom. That's kind of the opposite of forbearance, right? Which was the mind being immovable. <laughs> and there's a, there's a great story that's told um, in the Taji Tulun about this of the Buddha in a previous lifetime where he's a leader of a group of merchants. And they're going to an area where they think they're going to make a lot of big sales. And on the way, they get... Uh, they encounter a, a Rakshasa ghost, which is sort of like a demonic kind of kind of being. And this fearless merchant leader, who is Shakyamuni Buddha in his previous life, steps out and he tells the Rakshasa, you got to get out of the way. And he says, well, I'm not going to, so what are you going to do about it? And so the merchant tries to hit the Rakshasa to get him out of the way, and his hand sticks to him. And so he says, fine then. And he hits him with the other hand, and it sticks. And then he tries to kick him, and his foot sticks. And pretty soon, he's stuck to this Rakshasa ghost. And he says, you know, I'm just going to eat you. Like, there's really no point in, in persisting. And what the merchant leader says is, I really don't care. You can eat me, and I'm going to fight you the whole way. I'm not giving up. And then he headbutts him, and his head sticks to the Rakshasa ghost. <laughs> At which point, the Rakshasa ghost says wow, this guy is like really hardcore. And mm -hmm. he almost exactly says this, you know, he says, <laughs> wow, this guy, you're really not going to give up. on <laughs> And he's so impressed by it. He says, you know, I've never met somebody who has this much virya. And so he, he says, I'm going to let you pass. Yeah. Mm. It's a fun story. <laughs> <laughs> but this is an example of, of, you know, motivation for how we should be on the bodhisattva practice, you know, not punching ghosts and things, but, you know, the, the attitude of not giving up even when the circumstances are, are pretty horrific and we're bound to lose from the look of things, because there is always some hope of getting through it. <clears throat> and then additionally, I just wanted to mention that it's important that virya is present in all of these different elements of the Buddhist path, but virya is perfected by bodhisattvas. 
And uh, just to quote from the text, the Bodhisattva takes the power of vigor as foremost of Virya and uses it to practice the other paramitas, the other six that we saw earlier. Thus, Virya is practiced by practicing the other paramitas. The great compassion is seen as foremost by bodhisattvas. They have vigor like a father exhibiting loving kindness for his son who becomes ill while he single-mindedly seeks medicine to cure the disease. Thus, an aspect of virya is never forsaking living beings for even a moment. And that additionally, the bodhisattva's vigor takes the reality concordant wisdom cognizant of the true character of dharmas as foremost in his practice of the six paramitas. And to translate that, what we're talking about is the perfection of wisdom. That all of this energy is informed by wisdom, and it's for the purpose of cultivating wisdom. So you might be wondering now, how can you increase your virya? <laughs> there are many suggestions. <laughs> so one of the first ones is that we're asked to take an altruistic view. And we can see that in the four bodhisattva vows that we recite. The first one is to save all sentient beings. And the sort of other side of this is that we have to see that making a choice between the two, we see it in the Jataka tales and other places, the bodhisattvas consistently choose to not cherish their own body if it's going to get in the way of saving other people. They're, they're so altruistic that they're even willing to sacrifice themselves if they can save one sentient being. So that's your sort of paragon to look for, for one way that you can increase your energy, by being focused on other people. Another one is renouncing indolence, and that's the term that they're using in the Bhikshu Dharma Mitra's translation. You can also think laziness if that makes you feel more comfortable. <laughs> and uh, the Bodhisattva has to reject this sort of state of mind because it's something like uh, dark clouds that cover over the sun that represents wisdom. And so you really have to make the choice to reject sort of settling into that viewpoint, but that's another way that allows you to then have more virya. And there's a great analogy that says that indolence or laziness is like poisoned food that's fragrant and tastes good. It's really great going in, but then, of course, you suffer the consequences. But the other one is that having a mind of indolence is like a forest fire. And what it does is it burns up the entire forest of the merit that you cultivate through the good things that you do. If you don't do something with it, if you do a lot of good things and then you just sit back and say, wow, that was enough. None of those things really count. They go away. They don't last forever. Another way, of course, is contemplating the benefits of cultivating virya. So it's kind of a closed loop here. You know, you think about how good it would be to cultivate it. It helps you cultivate it. And it makes sense, right? So one can cultivate uh, or one can contemplate basically the benefits that you will get from engaging in your Buddhist practice and your life in general with <clears throat> more focus and effort and energy. But also, the sort of flip side of this is understanding that through that engagement, that's the way that we really get to understand the deep truth of shunyata. And so the other side of it is, you know that by putting that energy in, you're developing understanding and you're developing wisdom. So it's not just the energy for the energy's sake. You're thinking about, yeah, if I put just a little more effort, look what we're about to accomplish. There are also several uh, linked concepts that come up in, in uh, various Buddhist texts. And here they've translated as zeal and non-negligence. Um, and I think those seem fine based on at least the way that they're described. And to make sense of why these are important, um, Nagarjuna says they're essentially talking about the same thing, but different aspects of it. And he gives this analogy of a person who's going on the trip. And he says it's like the case of this man who decides he's going to travel a really far distance. And at the beginning of the trip, <clears throat> he gets very desirous of leaving, and he commits that he's going to do it. And that's the phase of zeal. But then when he embarks on this trip, and he refrains from stopping throughout the journey for sort of, you know, frivolous pit stops, etc., go get a monster energy drink and these kinds of things, <laughs> that's his display of virya, right? He sticks to what he's doing. He remains focused. He's diligent on, on what's important. And then finally, uh, the related aspect is non-negligence, which is him realizing when he's being distracted on the journey and bringing himself back to the focus, why he's there, what he was trying to do, what's really important. 
And so we can also, even though these are related, think of them as being sequential, that our initial zeal is what allows us to generate virya, and that that virya also allows us to experience non-negligence because we have a greater ability to understand when we're being distracted and et cetera. And uh, there's another nice analogy here of basically uh, we should think about our practice as like climbing a dangerous mountain where if we let our attention lapse for even a moment, we'll fall off of the side of it and be grievously injured or die. Another, another way that we can approach this is through contemplations. And uh, there's something that's uh, contemplation recommended for bodhisattvas, and it goes as follows. If I do not accomplish this, then I will not be able to gain the resultant reward. If I do not go ahead and do it myself, then it won't be the case that it shall somehow manifest through the efforts of others. If I do accomplish this, then it can never be lost. I think that's kind of a nice contemplation. Sort of, you want to see something done? Do it yourself. That's not saying don't ever rely on other people. It's saying if you think it's important, then you should be willing to do it. So I'm going to do it. I'll take the first step, and whoever wants to join in can. <laughs> Now, another, another one is um, cherishing results over comfort. And this is related to contemplating the benefits, thinking about what's going to come from, from your virya. And in this case, uh, cherishing the results over comfort is, uh, again, that if we realize that it's going to cause us discomfort to put effort into something, we really need to think about if that effort is going to be worth it in the long run. And that actually allows us to put up with a lot of things that we might not otherwise you do have to use some discernment in this because obviously you could just be doing yourself harm and also not accomplishing your results. And then, you know, there was really nothing from it. And you maybe should have exercised more wisdom. But there's a nice analogy that goes with this one as well, which is that your house catches fire. And the only thing that you have that holds water is this beautiful antique vase. It's a real work of art. Well, you're going to sacrifice the vase to save the house, right? I mean, you need that living space. Everything's there. I mean, you'd be a fool if you picked up the vase and ran out with it. I don't know if it's worth more than the house. Maybe that's a reasonable decision. But the idea is that, you know, not getting too attached to, you know, the preciousness of one small thing in the corner and really missing the big picture. And then also having just simply the determination to bring about liberation. And we're told here that instead of cherishing our bodies, we should cherish the results of practice. And that this allows us to seek medicines to cure the, uh, wait, no, that's, sorry, that's the previous page. <laughs> that allows us to be diligent in any of the possible postures that we can be in of sitting, lying down, walking, standing. The thing is that if we really draw a line in the sand and say that we're going to do this no matter what, that is actually powerful. And that's why we do things like making vows and promises and things like this. So at this point, Nagarjuna goes on a very interesting excursion into samsara, rebirth based on the actions that people take in various lifetimes. And it's a large section of the chapter. And I just picked a few key examples because we go into great detail of why you end up in the various realms. And one of the things I wanted to point out about this is I think it's very interesting to sort of externalize the qualities that are positive and negative about ourselves and see them as something that's not only mirrored in nature, but also in sort of the greater nature. These cultural beliefs predated Buddhism of these various, these various destinies that people could fall into after they died as a human, or an animal, or a god, or all of these things. But I think that we can sort of still see something interesting in the sort of narratives around why people end up in the places they do, and the sort of actions that are considered like more or less grievous and the kind of consequences that are believed to come from them through this way of thinking about it. The, the main takeaway, of course, for us, and the reason it comes up in a chapter on Virya, is bodhisattvas are seeing this, right? This is the thing that they see going on around them that motivates them to cultivate Virya for others and not just themselves. So they see all of the horrible things that are happening to everybody everywhere throughout all of these realms. And as the contemplation says, if I want somebody to do something about this, I need to be the one who takes the first step. But I did want to bring these in because I think they are very interesting. 
So the heavenly realms, there's very little time spent on um, because they're pretty straightforward. I mean, if you do good things, if you're a generous person, et cetera, but you still have a lot of attachments, if you're a good person, you can go to the heavenly realms and they're just you just live a pleasurable life for a very long time and then eventually you're reborn into a lower realm because there's no motiv motivation to cultivate anything there. So you don't really cultivate any sort of wisdom. You don't reach any level of awakening necessarily because there's no motivation to. But those ones, you know, it's not a bad place to go. It's just you're going to have to jump back on the merry-go-round when it's over. The animal realms, things start to get a little sticky. And, I mean, we know many happy animals. Like, for instance, Nikki, the temple dog, she's very happy and she's living a good life. But for many animals, it's not so great. <laughs> and um, one of the things I found interesting is that the animal realms are associated with the three poisons pretty directly. So... For those who live lives that are full of full of hatred, um, they tend to be reborn in the form of venomous snakes and insects, mm. which kind of makes sense, right? They've got a little bit of that poisonous attitude already. And so in the next lifetime, sorry, that's all you are. For people who are more driven by, by lust and sensuality, they take on the form of the various wild birds, which I found interesting. And the idea is that they're actually deprived of immense enjoyment because their skin is covered in feathers and they have sharp talons and beaks instead of hands and feet and things. And then additionally, people who are uh, mostly living lives of delusion end up taking on the form of various, uh, as the text put it, stupid animals, but I wanted to be more charitable and just say, you know, it's like things like worms, insects, things like this that we don't consider as really being the, the more thinking animals. But then we get into the really juicy stuff, which is the various hell realms. Oh and I included some of these for Christina because she wanted to know more about them. <laughs> so I only took a few examples because there are many, many hells in Buddhism. And we should always keep in mind that you're in a hell for a limited time. So you did something. At a certain point, the consequences come up. You're in a hell. But then you get out of that hell again. And you do have a chance to redeem yourself. It's just while you're in hell... Things are pretty dire, so you're not really going to be meditating, being generous to people, etc. You're basically just tormented. But the torments get very creative. So one of the examples I wanted to bring up, and uh, I thought this one was interesting, just, you know, considering various global events. Um, it's the burning forest hells. And it says in the text that if one sets fire to grasslands and forests, harming and injuring all of the insects, or perhaps if one sets fire to a forest in the course of hunting, thereby committing in injury on a vast scale, on account of all sorts of causal circumstances these, one falls into the burning forest hells. The grasslands and forests in these hells are ablaze, and thus thereby burn those with offenses. So in other words, if you're the kind of person who, like, destroys nature... You're just setting fire to forests and things like this, and you don't really care about the consequences. Well, guess what? You live in a forest fire for the next several kalpas. <laughs> Fun. They get kind of specific. It's interesting. Um, then there are the hot metal hells. And the hot metal hells are for people who... <laughs> People laughing. Not that kind of metal. Yeah. <laughs> Don't we have rockers? <laughs> So the, the hot metal hells are a special place for people who torment the poor. Oh, you really tormented the right one. Yeah, right. You, you really, yeah. It's, so, so the hot metal hells are for people who do things like tormenting the poor, for people who invade other people's lands, destroy their homes, and pillage them. And these people spend their time getting smashed by truncheons until they're basically pulped. And their skins are removed. And then what's left is minced. And then it gets cooked into a nice big gruel. <laughs> and then their body's reconstituted and they do it over again. And this is for many eons. So you're just getting pulverized, chopped up, turned into gruel. Nobody's even eating the gruel. They just reconstitute you and you continue. And just to be fair, because those two are hot hells, I did pick one of the cold ones. So the Arvada Hell, which most of the cold hells, by the way, um, have names that are onomatopoeia. They're named after the sounds that people make mm. from intense shivering to tell you just how miserable they are. They don't even have names that mean anything. <laughs> this one is not one of them, but 
Um, so the, the Arbita Hells uh, are a special place for people who cause people suffering in the winter months by taking away their ability to heat their homes. Mm. It's like a special place just for them. <laughs> and what happens is they're basically on a huge plain where there's no shelter. And periodically, a bracing cold wind blows through, and it's so cold it instantly freezes them and splits even their hair, their skin, their sinews, their bones, the marrow, everything. It splits them into little pieces. And as you might have guessed, they're immediately reconstituted, and the wind blows through again. Think about that when you cut off some of these utilities. <laughs> we should have an evening just on Hell's <laughs> Road. <laughs> Honestly, it was very fascinating. I spent a lot of time reading it. I picked, I picked a few examples, but it goes very in-depth. And the Hells are all in parallel under Mount Sumeru. It's very interesting from a structural perspective as well. <laughs> so, uh, now I lost the train of thought. All right. <clears throat> so, Viria and the Six Perfections. Now we want to talk about, we've talked a little bit about effort, but we want to talk about perfecting effort. We've talked a little bit about what's special for the Bodhisattvas. Can I do? Yeah. For the people who were just here, why don't you just mention what the Six Perfections are really yeah. again? So the Six Perfections are a set of six practices that are geared for pe toward people whose primary practice is to try to help others. And the practices are, the first is generosity, then ethical conduct, um, patience or forbearance. This is the fourth, which is virya or energy, diligence. Uh, the fifth is meditative concentration, and the sixth is the perfection of wisdom. And these are specifically for, for the bodhisattvas, who are people who are trying to help other people awaken. <clears throat> so now we're kind of getting, on, getting into what virya is for bodhisattvas, though I know we've been talking about it a little bit the entire time. And virya can be found in the other five perfections. Since all of them require effort, of course it's going to be there. And we get a brief characterization that uh, the Bodhisattva has virya in giving, in that they tirelessly give of themselves in the form of possessions, time, effort, etc., with no thought of not giving. That they also display virya in their moral virtue. In other words, they're always ethically upstanding, and they're very accepting of other people's ethical conduct. In other words, they're not very judgmental of others. And in the case that they even come close to breaking a precept or acting unethically, they're always open about their faults and willing to repent for that to try and do better the next time. <clears throat> Which I think is important because a lot of people tend to do something terrible and then they want to conceal it and hope nobody ever finds out. That's not the Bodhisattva <laughs> attitude. <laughs> Then also we see vigor in the cultivation of patience, which we talked about last month, which is that even in the most trying circumstances, bodhisattvas always exhibit patience and forbearance, and they don't experience regret or doubt in taking that action, which I think is difficult sometimes. Likewise, the bodhisattvas show virya in their cultivation of dhyana meditation or meditative absorptions in that we know from reading the various texts that bodhisattvas have these amazing powers of concentration so that they have pretty much like superhuman abilities that come from their ability to focus their minds. Things that to us just seem almost impossible. And then additionally, that they show virya in the cultivation of their perfection of, of the perfection of wisdom, which is the bodhisattvas diligently learn from their teachers and they always have an attitude of reverence for the wisdom that's imparted to them. And this includes they actually have a deep wholesome desire to be able to experience the true character of all phenomena. In, either word, in other words, to be able to cultivate wisdom beyond just discursive thinking. <clears throat> now, thinking a, bit, a little bit about the nature of the Bodhisattva's vigor, I think it's interesting first to think about the fact that virya comes up being divided into two categories, sort of physical virya and then mental virya. And when we think about the physical aspect of it, we can think about the example of giving, right? So it's, it's good to give things to people, but it takes physical energy. You have to make your body pick up the thing and hand it to somebody. So it requires that level of physical energy. And that's the physical side of things. To do all of these things, there's some physical component. But then likewise, there's a mental component. And the mental component has to do more with... Um, are sort of resolves, motivations, these kinds of things. So there also has to be, you know, that desire to be given to somebody. 
before you even need to engage the physical aspect of it. But there's something interesting about the Bodhisattva Sphiria, which is that in the process of trying to perfect Virya, we're told that the Bodhisattvas cultivate Virya in their normal, you know, Bodhisattva physical body that you see. So that's your body and mind as you know it, your sort of individuated mm -hmm. self. But that they're also cultivating Virya in their Dharma body. And we've talked about the Dharma body more than once uh, as being sort of incorporeal, or if you wanted to think about it corporeally, it would be basically the entire universe. If you wanted to think about it in the abstract, you could think about something like Buddha nature, the teachings themselves, etc. Well, the Bodhisattva is having this sort of transpersonal realization that the energy that they have as an individuated self is not really theirs in the first place. It's borrowed from somewhere else. And in that case, they have an amazing amount of energy that you wouldn't have otherwise. <clears throat> the reasoning behind this being they can sort of unveil it. They can remember that it's always there. They can tap into that source and be able to motivate themselves both physically and mentally beyond that. And so in that sense, their virya is something that is not dualistic, not really split into the physical and mental components. It's something that moves beyond that. It's a virya that's shared by all things throughout the universe. It's just an ability to sort of tap into that from their perspective as an individual when it's needed. And there's a, there's a great quote from the, from the text that says, it is just as has been stated by the Buddha. And the Buddha said, at that time, the vigor of the Bodhisattva becomes such that he does not even perceive the existence of a body and does not even perceive the existence of a mind. His body has nothing whatsoever which engages in doing, and the mind has nothing whatsoever which it bears in mind. The body and mind become as one and the same, and thus there is no making of such distinctions in this regard. In that path to Buddhahood, which is sought for the sake of bringing beings to deliverance or liberation, one does not perceive beings as constituting this shore, in other words, the world that we're currently living in, nor does he perceive the Buddha path as constituting the opposite shore, in other words, completion, the sort of realm of things being perfected and awakened. Everything done by the body and mind are set aside and relinquished, as if they were mere dream state endeavors, which are realized on waking, to have not involved the accomplishment of any endeavors at all. Pretty heavy stuff. But I think it's a it's a sort of interesting idea, right? Mm -hmm. I'll think about this the next time I think I'm tired, which is something that happens here during our training periods. And we are expertly instructed that we do, in fact, have more virya. All we need to do is use it. <laughs> and so far, it's been true. I haven't seen it fail. <clears throat> and uh, so just to close this out, you know, typically, I don't call these things conclusions. I've started referring to them as reflections. And part of the reasoning for that, and I thought I would give you a little insight, is that when I engage with the material that I'm preparing for a presentation, I don't really think of these necessarily as like my big picture takeaways so much as my way of sort of closing the book on my engagement with the material and sort of considering the topic. So, I mean, Nagarjuna had his own conclusions. We basically got to it right there with the fact that at the end of it, we realized that Virya is something that isn't individuated. It's this, it's this transpersonal energy that's present throughout the entire universe. <clears throat> oh, and I should have mentioned also, um, I meant to say this earlier, that we don't get a lot of instruction in Buddhist texts about the physical components of Virya. And part of the reason for that is we just had a presentation recently about understanding the presence of Qi, Qi, energy in the body and ways to be able to sort of redirect that and work with it. These were things that were already in the culture, so it was kind of assumed that people already had some method they used for that physical component of, of managing internal energy. So a lot more time is spent on how to think about and contemplate these things and establish motivations, really the mental aspects, because those were where there would be differentiation. So back to the reflections. <clears throat> One of the things I really want to hammer home is that, especially in light of that last, last quote and sort of what we were building to, is that you already have as much period as you need. The question is how you're able to harness it and be able to use it in the ways that you want to. And... <laughs> uh, 
it doesn't really come from within you. It comes from within the world outside of you, just like the rest of your body, your ways of thinking, your sense of self. All of these things come from somewhere else. They're all causally interconnected with all of the other things in the universe. And in that sense, so is the energy that you think you possess. It's always coming from somewhere else. You've probably heard these amazing stories of people who are, you know, existing nourished only by sunlight and like these kinds of things, which of course, like extreme, extreme cases. But I think you can notice that if you embark on um, a sort of very deep retreat where you are spending a lot of time doing contemplative practices, meditating, doing sutra recitation, etc., that you'll notice that you have like a diminished need for sleep and other things like that. And it's kind of interesting to see. It's almost like there's a shift in your normal behavior that allows you to sort of tap into all of the latent energy that you normally have that you're kind of disseminating and wasting on your various distractions and playing around. Additionally, we should keep in mind that everything you do requires effort, right? There's viria constantly. There's always some sort of dis some sort of uh, some sort of choice being made on what you're doing at any given point. There has to be some sort of intention behind it. There has to be some sort of physical movement. All of these things, there's always some sort of energy involved. And so when we're thinking about the perfection of Viria, one of the things that really changes is that we're trying to get to the bottom of developing insight into where we direct our energy. What are we doing with it? I mean, there are lots of fun things I could be doing, but I decided to put my energy into engaging this text, which is truly the most fun thing of all, I will admit. <laughs> but it's, it's something that I think is important. And so I'm willing to put a lot of energy into it to try and digest this and come up with a way that I can present it to you and, and be helpful to you. But this is true of anything that you do. If you spend a lot of your time complaining, that's where you're putting your virya. The other thing to keep in mind, and it was mentioned in the text, is that all of the per perfections, even though they're listed sequentially, we start with something easy like generosity, and then we develop our ethics, and then we develop patience with people, and then we start to develop uh, more control over the direction and focus of our energy to be able to develop meditative practices, and then finally to cultivate wisdom. That these things are, in one, on one hand, a linear process, but also they're not really linear. And throughout um, Nagarjuna's commentary where he's talking about the six perfections, we keep seeing this come up, regardless of which perfection that you see. That if you cultivate that perfection and you truly, truly develop it so deeply that you could be said to have completed it, to have perfected it, at that point, you've actually mastered the others by necessity. So when you're thinking about looking at these big lists of various practices, and I know this month, you know, we have Ohigan coming up, which is traditionally a time when we think about the, the six perfections and we maybe try to try some new practices um, in our sort of personal routine to try and help us cultivate some of those. The one of the tendencies is you see this big list and it's like, man, I got to get through the six. So I'm going to do a little bit of this one here and a little bit of this one and this one and this one. And we're actually recommended not to take that approach. And I can say from personal experience, being a person who does things like that, that it's actually much more useful to pick one and really try to go deep with it. And when you do, what you'll find is that you've actually uh, branched out into, by necessity, having to cultivate the other five. So with that, uh, I'd like to open it up for <laughs> questions, comments, and thoughts. This is an example of Viria in action in the animal world. <laughs> And then I see Ichishima Sensei is here. Oh, uh, Ohio Ichishima Sensei. Oh, Ohio Thank you very much for your nice presentation. And I'm very interested in the six perfections. Uh, let me briefly, can I tell us just a few minutes to discuss sure. about it? Okay. Well, around the end of the 8th century in Tibet, there was a controversy between, uh, you know, the Chinese side of Zen meditation uh, and the Indian side of Yogacara, uh, Madhyamika, uh, representing Kamarashira. And the, uh, as a re uh, the, the result of discussion, Kamarashira's Indian side of Buddhism got a victory. And since then, uh, Tibetan Buddhism 
follows uh, Indian style of meditation. You know, in the at uh, Kamarashira's point is six parts per perfection is very important. He divided into two parts. Uh, last wisdom, prajna uh, paramita, and uh, the from starting from dana to uh, dhyana. Uh, five perfections. Very first five perfections. He determined uh, this is uh, upaya. So upaya and prajna must follow always together. That is a very uh, important uh, message of Kamarashira. According to uh, uh, the end of the 11th century scholars of India, uh, Ratnakara Shanti, he said there were three turning point of, uh, of Dharma spreading. First is uh, uh, Simon at uh, uh, Sarnath uh, to the five big shoes, that is uh, first Simon, and then Nagarjuna and Asanga, this, you know, uh, nothingness or uh, Arabijnana, etc. So that is second uh, turning field. And the third turning field is the Kamarashiras, Upaya and Prajna. And these are, are from Bimara Kiruti Nirudesha. And uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, my friend uh, Robert Thurman, uh, he translated the holy teaching of Bhimara Kiruti uh, from Tibetan into English language. It says very interesting point. The dis uh, description of the Bhimara Kiruti as versed in uh, esoteric practices, the description of the family of Tathagatas, Bhimara Kiruti was identifying wisdom as mother, and the liberative technique as a father, exactly corresponding with the central tantric symbolism of male and female as Bajra and uh, Bell, and the like, the uh, yogic powers ascribed in the uh, Bodhisattva inconceivable uh, liberation, such as the uh, ability of take fire into in his stomach. This is a translation by Robert Sam of Bimara Kirti. I think uh, some Upaya, <laughs> uh, which includes uh, Hosbiria, etc., that's uh, five perfections. And this five perfection is very important, uh, developing Buddhism. Uh, so I think Kamarashira's uh, interest about uh, six perfections is very uh, suggesting uh, our practice of Buddhism. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sensei. No uh, more. I, um, I'm just going to mention, because we don't have that much time, and we'll have time for one or two questions, but I was just going to mention next week, I'm going to be doing the uh, fifth one, which is dhyana, which is meditation, because um, Ohigan begins the next day. It runs from the 19th through the 25th, I guess it would be. 20, yeah, 25th. So uh, Ohigan begins uh, next week, and I'll be doing meditation for Dhyana as the fifth of the six perfections next week. Um, so why don't we open it up for questions rather than my making any further statements?